Uh, this was prepared for a shorter time slot, and uh, I went over, so I haven't rerun it to see what it actually is. Uh, you might get some of your right back. We'll see. Uh, this was sort of synthesized just from my own experience and from a few talks I attended at RailsConf last year. Uh, I have, being uh, at the time a relatively new developer, still kind of new, uh, I was making a big part of my focus at work and just in learning development generally. Uh, how to learn, not necessarily learning, but how to learn faster, better, more, uh, and prepared this talk a little more. Um, and I looked at it from three different levels, the individual level, which was more applicable to me, um, but to bring it back to my team at uh, previously Mobi, now Tango. Uh, also looking at it from a team level and also an organizational level. So we're going to look at all three. Uh, some semantic things to get out of the way. Um, these are not opposed ideas, uh, but the one that I'm kind of preferring in this talk is the uh, growth model. Um, Knowledge is good, but it's sort of limited. Uh, it answers more how questions, it's an additive effect, uh, and it's a broadcast. It's like this, one person standing up here just delivering the information to everybody. Um, one time at best, we're being recorded, so better than that. Uh, and it's kind of limited by circumstance uh, in that you can only really talk about a specific situation and it's not really if it doesn't apply to other situations, it takes some abstract thinking on the part of the listener to apply it elsewhere. And that's more effort on their part, which hopefully they're willing to go through, but not everyone is going to make that leap. Um, for the purposes of this talk, we're going to prefer the growth model, which is answering more of the why questions than the how. Uh, that, in most cases, when applied correctly, is going to be more of a mul multiplicative effect than additive. Um, it's a continually sort of adds on itself and uh, multiplies other factors going into whatever task you're trying to develop. Uh, and the dynamic aspect, not being limited by that specific situation you're talking about, teaching people how to learn rather than just answering the one question that they have in front of them. Um, I learned from my last talk that code slides are problematic, especially if you use a dark background, so I learned a few lessons. Uh, object lesson in growth and knowledge. Uh, lighter background. This is also uh, taken from the last talk I did here. Uh, when working with strong brands, I talked a lot about, or part of it was about this particular method that really threw me for, for a day. Um, in short, fetch didn't do what I expected it to do. This may not be uh, mind-blowing for everyone, but it was not intuitive to me. If there is a value, uh, fetch is not going to evaluate the value of that key, it's just going to see if there is one there, so if the value is nil or false, you'll still get that back. With fetch, um, if you want it to go to the fallback, if there's no value, if there's a nil value, then you can't use fetch. Uh, this took me about three days to figure out. It shouldn't have taken that long, but it did, because I was a new developer when I was working on this. Um, but because of this experience and a few others in working on this project where we were adding strong parameters to our app, uh, I learned a lot about strong parameters. Um, I am not going to like speak for the whole team, but there are a few people that have said that, that when there's questions about it, I'm the one to come to, which really surprised me because I thought that I was just the new developer struggling through. Turns out, being good at something comes from struggling through it. Um, I use this example also because it's sort of conceit for the next couple slides in uh, the broader topic of growth. Um, so, talking about the individual level, uh, one thing that I apply specifically for myself is uh, making things easier on myself. The Every action, every decision that you do costs something in cognitive effort and time and just energy from your day. Um, so removing as many of those steps as possible through either habit, uh, compression, focus and routine is going to make the actual work you're doing a lot easier. Um, these are not going to be applicable by everyone, just examples of this concept. Uh, my desktop layout is constant. I always have calendar and email on the far left, team chat next to that, terminal, editor, uh, the actual browser with the app running so I can see it, and then time-wasting apps further down the line. 
Um, because of that, I never have to think about where my applications are. I never have to worry about what desktop I'm on, what's on top of what, what corner I moved something to. It's always, always going to be in the same place. I don't have to think about that. The only stuff I have to think about is the actual work that I'm doing. Um, that small, like really small thing has saved me so much time and cognitive effort in the work that I do that it makes the work that much easier. I can focus on the thing that I'm actually needing to think about, not thinking about where did I leave that tab? Where is, which desktop is my terminal in? Uh, so other ways of applying this alias, everything, uh, delegate things to Alfred, set up automated tasks, organize your schedule. Uh, there's a lot of ways to apply this, but the idea of not ha saving yourself work by doing that little bit of work up front. Uh, along with the schedule idea, um, I like having a very flexible schedule, but still keeping a schedule. Uh, setting a routine for things like doing code reviews so that you're not getting chased around or having to chase other people around to get something in. Um, just having a set time twice a week, however often you want to, uh, just set a time, this is when I do code reviews, and if you don't have any code reviews to do that day, uh, pick something else to do during that time, but still make sure the time is set aside. Don't just run over whatever task you're doing, like, oh, there's nothing to do, I'll keep working on this. Still make the conscious effort to break, move to a different task, so you always have that sort of carved out habit of, this is the time that I should do X thing. Um, if you set that routine and keep it, then you'll always have time for the things that you consciously prioritize. Uh, if anyone used Astro when that was a thing, RIP Astro, I don't know if anyone other than me did, but it's gone now. Uh, so this is where the reference to Fetch came up. This is just uh, grabbing some ideas, not necessarily evaluating the value. I'm going to just talk through a few of them quickly. If they sound valuable to you, take them home, take them back to your teams. Uh, your, this is the individual level, so take them back to your own habits. Um, when pairing, uh, there's usually sort of an unequal knowledge level in pairing. Uh, tends to be, just because of, when, when you need to pair with someone, it's probably because they have more knowledge in the specific corner of the app. Um, Doing a walkthrough of whatever file or whatever system you're working in before starting the pairing session uh, will multiply the time that you get working through it. You don't have to stop and explain every method, every line. Uh, just do a quick walkthrough, and the rest of that session that you have is probably going to go 10 times smoother. Um, setting up the option for newer developers to write documentation as an exercise in learning the application. I don't think I've talked to anyone that thinks that their, uh, their application or their workspace is sufficiently documented, so as a way to sort of onboard newer developers, have them write that documentation. They'll learn the code and you get better documentation out of it. Um, always celebrate success and failure, both. Uh, this is, I think, an important, um, going, going back to that initial example of sort of Working on that strong parameters project, uh, I brought down a major portion of our app for a day. It wasn't a huge issue, but it was bad. It was definitely a failure. But through that process of working on that and learning that, I now have much deeper knowledge about that system. Uh, so even though it was a failure, the attempt made me a better developer and made me more knowledgeable about that system. Uh, with check-ins and one-on-ones, uh, make sure that whichever side of that you're on, it's two-way. Uh, always accept feedback from your reports as well as uh, your seniors. And then set goals for yourself. Um, set small goals like, this is what I want to do today. But set yearly goals like, part of this talk, for the past year, my focus has been uh, accelerating my learning, my knowledge, like learning to learn better get good at this sort of thing. Uh, so looking at a few things on the team level, um, broadly fostering growth is going to be better than transmitting knowledge. That may or may not be obvious, I think it is, but um, yeah, I'm not going to say much about it. Um, the individual skills to mentorship are not necessarily intuitive. They're kind of contextual. Depends on what your team needs, what different individuals respond to. Uh, for both sides of a mentorship 
process, whether that's a team lead or if you have some sort of mentoring structure. Um, it is something that needs to be learned over time. So it's a slower start to get that kind of foster growth process than just to get up in front of somebody and talk through something. Um, but the way it pays off is going to be much better if you're engaging with the other person. Um, Well-documented tools on a team level, um, just having everybody on the same page so that if you get into a pairing session or if you're talking about a problem, you're speaking the same language, you can communicate more effectively. Um, Inter-team communication uh, methods are important too in things like Flowdoc or Slack or whatever you use. Um, keeping signal and noise separate, so having channels specifically for like just screwing around, uh, gifts, social space, but specific team questions, specific topic uh, uh, discussions go in a more serious channel. Um, with that, uh, and, the, and the second point there, keeping the knowledge easily accessible, uh, keep technical questions out of one-on-one -on -one chats. If it expands to the point where it's no longer constructive in front of everyone, then maybe take it to a one-on-one. -on -one. But ask the question in front of everybody so that everybody sees the answer, because somebody else is probably going to have that question, or has had that question in the past. Uh, and then supporting autonomy. I enjoy the uh, work from home time that I get and the support from all levels of leadership at now Tango in that uh, I'm frequently asked, are you engaged with, are you interested in the work that you're doing? Which seemed like a novel thing to me, like that was really new in a job for me. Um, so supporting developers sort of taking their own tasks, uh, grabbing what they want to work on, what they're engaged with, that's not always possible. There's needs uh, that have to be met sometimes, but at least checking in on that front is going to be useful to everyone on, on the team. And then keeping a blameless culture, um, just if you, if you have the processes set up correctly, uh, a catastrophic failure should never really be one person's fault, uh, so blame shouldn't be a part of it. Um, a few other just quick to cover ideas on a team level. Uh, we just started doing uh, monthly mob programming, programming sessions on uh, my team at Tango, and they've been super productive so far. We find a problem that is beyond whoever currently has it in their queue, get everyone that's sort of invested that has knowledge on that level in a room, and work through it as a group. Um, it's new for our team, we've only done it twice, but both times everyone has come out of it with a positive experience. Um, setting up something like uh, the domain level documentation is sort of obvious, just giving like more than just what this method does, but what sort of the purpose of this whole class does and how it fits into the larger app is going to be useful to uh, new members onboarding the team. Uh, setting up something like a most wanted list, if there's something that everyone constantly bitches about in the app, um, document that. And then when you're at a, a point where the needs are sort of low and everybody has some free time, encourage people to take it on as a free Friday or just a week-long project, like our ticket queue's low. low. Uh, let's look at this thing that everyone's been complaining about and everyone knows about it. We have the time to take it on now. Uh, this one I don't really love, but it was, it was mentioned in one of the talks at RailsConf, is screencasts documentation. Uh, it seems like that's got a really front-loaded setup cost for me, but uh, it, I agree that it has a much uh, quicker turnaround for content creation and cons consumption. Once you have sort of the, the ability to facilitate that, it, it is a faster way to, to transmit knowledge, but it's still transmitting knowledge. Um, and then I talked about uh, engagement, being asked if, if you're engaged, and then asking your reports if they are engaged. Uh, that engagement level is going to be way more valuable to the organization than just raw productivity uh, and something that the developer doesn't really care about. And then a few points uh, on an organizational level. This gets its own slide because I thought it was the most important thing that I got out of uh, some of these talks that I listened to and articles I read. 
A values fit um, is often going to lead to a culture fit, but the reverse is not true. Just because somebody fits in well on a social level does not mean that they value the same things and are going to work well with the rest of the team. Um, everybody loves to talk about culture fit, and it is important, but values fit and what these people really care about as far as what they're doing and how they're doing it is going to be far more beneficial to get that to mesh on a team. Um, and then a few comments just on, on hiring uh, at an organizational level. If your hiring process, which is not something I'm really qualified to talk on, so we'll just assume that it's good. Um, if your hiring process is good, then trust that system. Uh, trust that you hired them for a reason. Uh, allow them the autonomy that we talked about in some of the other slides. Um, don't assign blame. Don't uh, basically just affirm the fact that you hired them with good reason and believe that they can do the job that they were hired to do. Um, and then when you're at that higher level and able to do this coordination, uh, you are going to find strengths and weaknesses. Uh, try to coordinate those and pair them so that they complement each other. That one's a little obvious, but uh, worth mentioning. Um, I don't remember the context of this quote from Tony Drake, but it is a Tony Drake quote, and he's not here. Uh, but I think it was, uh, I don't know who it was, but someone asked him how he got to be at the senior developer position that he was in at Moby at the time. Um, and it was just basically being thrown into the fire. It's, you have to learn the hard way. There's no, there, I'm sure there are some organizations where you can just put in the time and you'll get there, but the best way, I think, is to have to learn it, to make the mistakes, to go through the, the hard process and come out a better developer on the other side. Uh, and then allow for experimentation. Um, we just had two on our, our team at Tango. We just had two really big PRs that were just refactoring. Um, both of them ended up taking, I think, three or four people to do the code review. They were thousands of lines of refactoring. Just because uh, the feature we've been writing took a long time, but we threw it all together really quick. We just got it to do the thing at the end, knowing we're going to need the retrospective on this to go back and do some refactoring. Um, having the freedom to do that, a lot of times that will be said, we'll come back to this, and then it doesn't actually happen. Um, but letting your teams do that, will improve the quality of life for everyone that has to touch that code in the future. Uh, and then talking about an organization's reputation, um, it's sort of a, a hard thing to quantify, but when it's lost, you know. Um, if you have and if you can build and maintain a positive reputation, um, talented developers are going to come to you. If you invest in the health and happiness of your employees, they're going to want to work for you, they're going to stay. If you lose that, it's much harder to rebuild it than it is to get it in the first place. Uh, so just treat your people well to begin with, and that'll never be an issue. Uh, and then the quick overview of a few ideas um, just to, to look at again, not evaluating their value. Um, we already mentioned affirming the hire. Uh, just trust your system, trust the people that you've hired. Um, diversity hires as a milestone for the organization, not a goal line. Um, talking about diversity hires is not, I don't, people have differing opinions on it. A lot of people think it's just really good, but it's really not. If the best person for a job at your organization doesn't feel comfortable working on the team that you've built before they got there, because they're the only person in the room that looks like they do, that acts like they do, that lives that way, then you can't hire them. If they're the best person for the job, but they don't want to work for you, you can't have the best person. Um, so keeping an open mind to uh, developers that don't necessarily fit your culture, but fit your values, will let you build the best team. Uh, and then celebrate success and failure is on this slide again, because uh, it applies at the organization level too. It's a little weirder at this level, but it's just as important to acknowledge that Growth and learning comes through doing things wrong. Um, build the safety net to sort of recover from those things, but allow for it. It's inevitable, but it's how people grow. And then encourage time wasting. Um, we have all over the office. We have these little like die cast puzzles. The I don't the company's Hanayama, I think, but they're 
they get an absurd amount of use. I am really surprised to see how often they're in somebody's hands. Um, but just having things to do to go blow off steam, to just change gears and come back to the problem that you're working on is extremely important. And not just allowing it, but encouraging that. Those were all bought, by the way, uh, by our department head, not brought in by developers. So encourage that, don't just allow it. Uh, and then keep things as stable as possible because as we said in the previous slide, um, keeping developers happy will keep them there. If you lose that reputation, it's harder to rebuild it. But don't let it go stagnant. You should change things up. Um, reorganize to address and complement your developers' strengths and weaknesses. But um, don't do it so often that they start feeling shaky in the organization. Um, so that's um, basically all I have. Just the, the three levels of individual organization and team, um, looking at a few ideas on how to foster growth with those three. There's no good ending planned for this, so ending. <laughs> obligated to ask if there are any questions. <laughs> but really, any questions? Uh, I thought the mob program was interesting. I know you've only done it a couple times, but what sort of situations brought that up? Um, the first one, I don't remember what actually prompted it, but the what we ended up tackling, oh, because it was the first, I remember now, because it was the first one, I picked something that I thought would be super easy. I was wrong, and happily so. Uh, we needed to add a sidebar to a modal that already existed. It had been built for another modal, we just needed to bring it into this one. Um, but the way the, the data needed to be passed in, there were really only like two people on the team that understood sort of the deep magic of that particular corner of the app. Um, so I picked that as a task to, to set us up for an easy win, like this is just gonna be a short session. Um, Luckily, I got the people that knew how that corner of the app worked in the room. We got started and realized it was much more complicated and everybody learned about what had previously been a very siloed piece of the app. Um, so the, the second one was not as successful, but still I think went well. Uh, we ended up writing no code. It was a problem where we had some uh, hard failures happening in the app that weren't being caught by anything. And I saw this and thought this is an issue we need to write in some sort of a like base level safety net. Um, but in discussing it, all of the cases that we thought might hit this uh, were not ever actually going to happen in production. So we, we talked through it for probably an hour, an hour and a half, and decided not to do anything. Um, so the, I think the, I don't know, those aren't, that's not a good general answer, but specifically, those are two things we've tried so far. Uh, as far as a general answer, I think just anything that would otherwise require like three or four pairing sessions, like if you, if you need to go pair with this guy because of this aspect of the problem, but then the next day it's another pairing session because of this aspect of the problem, just get all those people in one room and knock it out in an afternoon rather than taking a week. I don't know if that answers the question yet. Any others? Okay. Thank you, Chris.